good, that's good. All right, just high five somebody, tell them Happy Easter and you can be seated. High five somebody, tell them Happy Easter, you can be seated. So uh, if you don't know me, my name is Eric. I am one of the pastors here and I'm glad that you joined us for our Easter service because we decided, we were studying, like thinking through what, what do we want to talk about on Easter? And here's what I know. I know that uh, we, we have 21 different locations as of this Easter. Come on, make some noise for that, that's awesome. Yeah, so there'll be 21 different Free Grace United Churches of this Easter. And at all of these different locations, people come in the door at all these different churches. Uh, I, I know there are people, couples are holding hands and they're all smiley and everything, but on the inside, they're, they're, they're debating about whether or not they're gonna even stay together. I, I know it happens all the time. Every, every weekend, we have people coming in the doors of these churches and they're, and, and they're walking in the door and they're struggling with depression and suicide and, and discouragement and, and, they're, and they're, they're looking for a little bit of hope. Or, I, I, in fact, uh, years ago, somebody put a nine millimeter bullet in my hand after a service. And I went to sh shake their hand and they put a nine millimeter bullet in my hand and I'm like, why are you giving me that? And they said, hey, I'm just giving you this because uh, today I, I was gonna take my life. But instead of taking the shot, I thought I'd give Jesus a shot. So he came to service and he said that Christ had changed his life that day and he said, you just saved my life. And so as we were thinking through like what the possibility of what we talk about at Easter, we decided we were gonna call it, the name of my t-shirt, we're gonna call it Morph. Come on, say Morph. 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 There is power to change. Come on, say I can change. I can change. Now, and I know that like immediately you're like, man, I'm not sure if I buy the whole change thing. So uh, three weeks ago, I'm praying over a guy who comes into service, after, like literally end of service, comes up to me after service, asks if I'd pray for him. Uh, I asked why, he says, well, I have, I'm in stage four cancer, I have a brain tumor, I got a tumor in my lungs and a tumor in my heart. The doctors give me less than a year to live. And he said, well, you just pray for me. So I just prayed a big old prayer in Jesus' name, bring heaven down, I invite you to heal this guy from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. We just prayed a big old healing prayer and I didn't think much about it and I kind of sent him out the door. Uh, and then last Friday, I got a text from his friend that he is totally, I mean totally healed. Every brain tumor is gone. Every, oh, every tumor in his body is gone. It's, I, I got to see the scans, like the, the brain scans, like the scan with the tumor and the scan without the tumor. Like it just, there's no way to explain it. The doctors have no explanation for it at all. Uh, last Friday also, my, my son Aiden, who was the guy running all over the stage with the hat on that loves to play guitar and like is very happy about it. <laughs> so he was in downtown Anoka and he's walking on the streets and he ends up bumping into this guy and he talks to this guy for a long time. Evidently this guy's super strung out on meth, like he was so high he didn't even know if he was gonna reckon, remember the, the story afterwards. But he just started telling about Christ and telling about Jesus and how Jesus changed his lives. At the end of this little conversation, he said, would you like to pray to trust Christ and, and receive Jesus? And he said, yes. So he prays right there on the streets in, in Anoka, receives Christ. The second, I kid you not, the second he prayed, Aiden said that he instantaneously was sober. Like the second he prayed to receive Christ, it was like, boom, something happened to that guy and he was instantaneously changed. So when we talk about morph, come on, say morph. We believe that you have the power in Christ to change, that Jesus Christ still does miracles. The Bible is not a book in which God used to do miracles and doesn't do them anymore, but the Bible is a book in which God used to do miracles and they are deposits for the fact that he still wants to do miracles in your life too. Is that good news, church? Yeah. Come on, say, God wants to do miracles for me. God wants to do miracles. In fact, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says this, it says, if anyone is in Christ, or if you follow Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Who you used to be, not who you are anymore. The old you, dead and gone, you changed who you are. You became new. You morphed. You changed. You had transformation. We believe that God still does change lives. I want to give you an example of that. So before I do the rest of the sermon, I'm going to invite uh, Justin Barnett to the stage. Justin, give it, up, give it up for Justin as he comes up. Justin has only become a follower of Jesus in probably the last year and a half, and I just want you to hear his story for a minute about what Christ has done in his life. Go ahead, bro. All right, so, yeah, I mean, I wasn't really, like, raised with religion. I didn't have it in my home. Um, I never attended church, so it wasn't really something I knew much about. Um, but I kind of realized as a kid we kind of have this instinct to, like, speak to God, and uh, I realized I was going through a lot of crap when I was a kid, and I mean, I was, I was snorting pills with my mom before I was in double digits, and I realized I had an addiction I wasn't even, like, really old enough to have yet, and 
I started praying, not really knowing I was praying, but I was talking to God, and um, I kind of had this little idea of who he was based off my mom kind of telling me that, you know, hey, mom, what's in the sky? Oh, God lives up there. And uh, so I, that's kind of what I thought of him. Um, I got older, and I ended up, obviously, that, that addiction took hold of my life. And I was 12 years old, and I landed in maximum security lockup in Lionel Lakes, um, I, started, I was in there for a while, and then they sent me to a treatment. I was gone for 15 months, and I came back, and I guess what I really like got out of that is more, more hate, more anger, and more rage. And I was like, you know what? If there's a God, he's the reason for this. He's the reason why my life sucks, why I lost my whole family because I, well, I didn't get to see my family anymore. I couldn't see my auntie, my grandma, my sisters, and it's God's fault. Everything that's happened is his fault, and that's how I've seen life, and I, I kind of kept that outlook um, for a long time until I was about... I would say about 25, um, I was actually making a rap album. I had a record label that, not, 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 nothing big, I wasn't that cool, but I had a little record label I was working with, you know, kind of as a side hobby, and it was, it was all demonic stuff, like God is nothing, like don't believe in him, don't follow, it was like all worshiping demonic stuff, and then uh, one day I had my eyes opened up real hard. Um, I, was, I was praying, and uh, I decided to pray for the first time because I realized that my life was a mess. My kids, I looked at them and I'm like, I am a, I'm the dad I vowed to never be. And so I prayed and I said, okay, God, if you're real, um, can you give me a wife, like somebody who's gonna love me and I can actually love her because I was struggling with not only pills and drugs, but I was struggling with women. Um, and the, I couldn't maintain a relationship after two days. I was like, I just don't like you. And that's just how my mentality was. And then God gave me this girl two days after this prayer I ended up meeting my wife now, um, but I ended up meeting this girl, and she, uh, she was a Christian. I wasn't. She tried to kind of lead me down that road, and I wasn't having it. Um, it started off good, but I kind of like gave God the peace out, thanks, and uh, my life crushed itself all. I was the most unhappy after about a year into that relationship. I seen a woman who I loved more than anything, but for some reason, even the love I had with her couldn't fill me up, no matter how bad I wanted it to. I was on the hill over there, um, that hill where they do frisbee golf. It was about three in the morning, I had a nine millimeter, and I was probably pretty close to overdosing at this point, and I was about to kill myself, and I was praying, and I was like, all right, well, if you're real, you're gonna save me, and sure enough, it's, it's 3 a.m., and for some reason, Jess wakes up, and I hear her running out the parking lot, screaming my name, because she realized the gun was missing. And I go inside, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna die, like I felt death, I literally seen death like over me and as I was sleeping and I was like, if, if it's my time, like Lord, we, we just give me, I will follow you, just tell me what to do, tell me what to do and if you do, I will follow you for the rest of my life. And I had peace, I fell asleep and what I seen was, I had a, I had a dream and in this dream, um, I was on a hill and I heard a voice in the sky that sounded like thunder. I literally, in this dream, I felt my entire body shake like there was thunder inside of me. And it was, uh, asked, you know, it was, it was the Lord telling the world that we've forsaken him. We walked away. And then everyone on the hill, though, they were happy. And I was on this hill, and I was like, I don't belong on this hill. Uh, everyone else is super happy, and I'm like, all right, well, I feel like I should be down there with those guys getting yelled at. And um, all of a sudden, God comes onto this hill, and he starts walking toward me. I'm like, no, not me, not me, not me. And I'm like trying to hide. I'm going as far away as I can. And then I'm like, okay, uh, this is, this is going to happen. He comes up to me. And this is, you know, a question that we should all really ask ourselves a lot of times. It's a question that changed my life. God looked at me in that dream, and he said, whose child are you? And it really made me think. I'm like, wow, whose child really am I? And I didn't know much about religion, but I was like, well, I guess I'm yours. And... Then he looked at me again, and he said, as he, he went, and he, he touched me on the forehead, and he said, I'm not here. And then he put his hand on my heart, and he said, I'm here. And that was really eye-opening for me. I, I woke up, I didn't speak for days. My wife called Pastor Silas, and she was trying to get me into a church, trying to get a pastor to talk to me, and I had no words. I was like, I was so baffled and just shocked. And at this point, I knew God was real. Um, and then he ended up leading me in another dream. Um, he said that I needed to get baptized. So I ended up talking to Pastor Silas. Um, and I told him I would follow him if he saved me and didn't let me die that night. So there I was about to get baptized. But I still was like challenging him because even when I was going to get baptized, I was still high. And I, I believed in God at this point, but I just, I didn't really take that step all the way. My life was still like 
in my hands. I didn't really give it to God yet. And uh, I went to go get baptized. And I remember walking down the hill um, toward the river. And I, my palms were sweaty. And I was just like, I was so nervous. And I was so high. And I just was so broken and lost and had no idea what I was even doing. And I went into that water feeling like that. But when I came up, I was, I was a completely different person. Every burden I ever had was laid at the feet of Jesus. I came up with confidence and knowing that the Lord is real. And I would testify that for the rest of my life. So that was just about a year and a half ago. In the last year and a half, I have seen people put hands on people and heal them. I have seen God perform miracles in people's lives. I've seen people get sober, myself get sober. I've seen relationships healed. My neighbor came to my house at one point and we had a prayer circle over her. I, she had cancer and it was pretty bad. And she had never really gone to the church thing. She, she didn't really do that. And we all put our hands over her, we prayed over her. She came back the next day after appointment, she said she was completely healed. You can't tell me that God isn't real. You can't tell me that prayer isn't real. And the Bible is real. And baptism is very real, and it's what saved my life. It's the moment I went under that water. And I'll testify to the day I die. Oh, give it up for Justin one more time. Come on, say change is possible. We just told a bunch of stories about how Jesus Christ actually does change lives today. And I know living out in the world, you're kind of like, man, things never change. Nothing's ever going to be different. But I want you to know that God actually does still change people's lives. And there are people all over this building, as well as a whole bunch of other locations that have seen God do miraculous things in their life. If God have done something really good in your life, can you make some noise right now? Okay, there you go. It's Pretty simple. So here's the question I want to ask tonight then if we're going to have this conversation is how is all this change possible? How are we made new? In fact, the answer to that question is super simple. It's just a picture. It's why you're here at Easter. It's this thing called the empty tomb. Come on, say empty tomb. Empty tomb. There's only one tomb like this on earth. Every other tomb, every other place where somebody's gone in a coffin, been put in the ground, when they went down, it was for good. It was forever. They got put in the tomb, never again did they come out. In fact, every religious leader went into a tomb. Muhammad went into a tomb, stayed there. Buddha went into a tomb and stayed there. Joseph Smith went into a tomb, stayed there. Every political leader from all of human history, when it was time to go, they went in the tomb. But there's one tomb where a dude actually came back out. That's why he can change lives. If he can conquer death, he can conquer everything anything. If he can show back up three days later after being murdered and be like, hey guys, I'm back. If he can conquer death, he can conquer anything that you ever face. This is why Christ is special. Does that make sense? In fact, this is what the book of Isaiah says. This is a 2,700 year old prophecy. This prophecy is 2,700 years old. It says this, in that day there shall be a root in Jesse, or somebody will come from King David's family line. That's Jesus. Who will stand as a banner or symbol of hope. Like the bat signal in the sky, boom, someone will come as a symbol of hope. That's, that's Christ to the people. For the Gentiles will seek him and his resting place or his tomb shall be what? Glorious. Shall be glorious. Now what's really cool is what this glorious word means in Hebrew because the Bible, Old Testament's written in Hebrew, New Testament's written in Greek. This was originally a Hebrew word for the word glorious and here's what it means. It just means the word kavod. It means weight or heavy, important, special, distinctive, majestic. And then there's this phrase at the end that I like so much. It is intrinsically linked to the what? To the divine. There's something special. Eventually, somebody will come, and his tomb is more special than anybody ever. In fact, it will point to God himself. Only one guy ever conquered the grave. Only one guy ever conquered the tomb. Only one guy ever, ever was able to punch the Grim Reaper in the face and then show back up alive. And it's Christ because his tomb is glorious. So here's what we're going to do. In a real just short amount of time, I just want to have this conversation. I want to give you five ways in which the resurrection of Jesus can still change your life today. Come on, say change my life today. In fact, I gave you a little note sheet. If you want to write some stuff down, you're welcome to. But I just want to talk about how that glorious tomb can do miracles for you today. 
How many of you would like to have, there, there's some ways in your life you're like, dude, I'd like to see a little bit of life change in this way. Can I see your hands if you have some areas you're like, dude, I'd, I'd like to see some. Okay, this will help. So five little thoughts on the resurrection and how it can change your life. Number one, number one, the resurrection of Jesus is life changing because now we know that there's life after death. Now, you ever like turn the TV on and they're like, hey, we're trying to figure out, discover is there life after death? And there's like near death experiences and they're having all these conversations and they're wondering, I wonder what happens when we die. We already know. A guy came back from the dead and told you. He did it, for real. 2,000 years ago, he showed back up. He's like, hi guys, not really dead, alive now. I conquered death, and I'll tell you what happened after I was gone. And he tells us very clearly. We don't have to worry about what happens after death. Jesus tells us very clearly so you don't have to stress about this. In fact, two verses, John eleven twenty five. 25, he says this. He says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they what? It means, and I'm just gonna throw it out there, you're not just worm food. The death rate's still 100% as far as I know. Unless it changed in like the last 24 hours and I didn't know about it. Okay, so still 100%, right? But according to what Jesus just, just said, he's like, hey, if you die, yeah, you will live. You, you, you will go on existing for all eternity. Someplace. And Jesus is like, hey, I know where you're gonna go because I've already been there. I've been there, I conquered death so that you would know what happens next. In fact, this is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. He says this, or, or the apostle Paul says this, God will raise us from the dead. God will raise us from the dead by his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead. In other words, Jesus is your deposit. Guaranteeing you're gonna rise again. Those who trust Christ rise again to walk with him in eternity. Those who choose to reject Christ, you will still rise again, but you will be apart from Christ forevermore. But truthfully, we know what happens after death because Jesus told us. Now just for a second, I want you to take your hands and I want you to look at both of your palms. Just look at both of your palms. Do you know this is an M on every one of your palms? On each hand. There's an M on your left hand, and there's an M on your right hand. To be human is to have this M. In the, I'll, I'll show you. See, I, I traced it with a marker on my hand. No, no, it's actually on yours too. Like every, every hand has it. You have, if you just crinkle your fingers up, you'll see it. Look at that. You got an M. You got an M on the other one too. Every hand, every human being has them. Theologians say that it stands for the Latin words memento mori. Remember you are mortal. God stamped on your hands. Remember, life is short. You're gonna spend eternity someplace. Memento mori. God's gonna resurrect you. It's not an if, it's not a maybe. We know what happens at death because Jesus conquered death and you will be someplace after you die. And we gotta get that figured out. Second thing, the resurrection of Jesus is life changing because our sins are wiped out. Our sins are wiped out. Now, uh, just real quick, does anybody in here, like your home, you just have real bad like iron, hard water problems. Can I see your hands if that's, that's your place? Okay, it's a Minnesota thing. Okay, so we have this farm in Iowa. We inherited this farm in Iowa. And the farmhouse was, I mean, it's, it's an old place. If you turn the water on, it, it, within about five minutes, your sink is orange. Uh, it, it, the bathtub's gonna be orange. The toilet's gonna go orange really quick. It's just, the water's just, I mean, it's just really, really brown. And we've been trying all kinds of stuff to get this, this orange out of all of the sinks and the toilets and like, what are we gonna do? So finally, Kelly and I found this product. It's called Rust Aid. Some of you came to church just to find out about this. <laughs> <laughs> this little product, Rust Aid, is awesome. In fact, you just like squirt a little bit of this stuff on whatever's orange and you don't scrub it. You don't dilute it with water. You, you don't try to mix it with something else. You just let it sit and it, it just, the rust just disappears. It just, it just goes away. It's, it's awesome stuff. And what's crazy about it is that's what Jesus is trying to tell you his blood is for us. The blood of Christ is like rust aid for your soul. Because the longer you live, the more your soul gets, just gets all covered in gunk. 
In fact, I, I would say it like this. The longer you live, the more mistakes you make. That's what it is to be human. Right? The, more you, the longer you live, the more mistakes you make. So the more you're like, oh, I got this. I can't, like, I'm, okay, I'm 48. I got a lot more mistakes than when I was 18. And I just have all of this stuff. And I'm like, man, I wish I could get rid of all this stuff. And he's like, hey, hey, hey. My blood at the death of Christ washes every stain from your soul away. That all this guilt and baggage and shame and all this, the mistakes of your past, God goes, hey, I got this. In fact, he goes so far as to say this in Romans chapter four. This is super cool. He says this. He was delivered, talking about Jesus. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. So Jesus died for your sins. You've probably heard that before. Jesus was, has died for your sins and was raised to life. That's why the empty tomb matters. For our justification. Everybody say justification. justification. It's a big word that means this. Just as if I never sinned. When Christ rose, it was like, Every sin for all of time just wiped out. It was like sh, 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 on the whole world. And every mistake, every guilt, every shame, every struggle, every issue, everything that you have ever done that was a mistake and dishonored God, he was like, I got you covered, bro. In fact, sometimes I, I live in regret from some of the stuff that I did when I was younger. And I'll start to be like, God, man, I'm, I can't believe I did that. And he goes, did what? Like, well, what do you mean? I did that when I was like, like, I don't know anything about that. Justification, just as if I never sinned. I don't, I don't know what you did. I, it never happened in my book. When Christ dies for you and forgives your sins, when you turn to Christ, he washes it away and he remembers it no more. It's like it never happened. It's like, it's like somebody else did that thing that I regret. I didn't do that thing. Somebody else did. It's just as if I never sinned. When Christ rose, Boom! He washed it clean. Is this good news? So your biggest regrets, those weren't you, bro. That was somebody else. If you've given your heart to Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, that's somebody else's life. God doesn't even know it ever even happened. It is just as if you never sinned. Is that good news? And then you get to number three. The the resurrection of Jesus Christ is life-changing. Because now we have access to the power. Come on, say access to the power. power. I've got the power. Sorry, I couldn't help it. (laughs) Access to the power of resurrection for ourselves. Now, how many of you have an an addiction background of some kind? Like, are you familiar with the 12 steps, that kind of thing? Can I see your hands? Okay. So, familiar with the 12 steps at all, when somebody struggles with an addiction, alcoholism, drug abuse, whatever, and you go to a meeting, they say, hey, you need to get a higher power. If you can just get a higher power, you can begin to conquer this. Well, what I want to tell you is there's probably, I I can't think of one, no greater higher power than the guy who conquered death. Dude, if he can conquer death, don't you think he can conquer meth? Yes or no? Yes. I mean, like, he, 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 he he can conquer death. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Like, if, if somebody can conquer the only thing that nobody else has ever conquered, anything you face, come on, say anything I face, anything he can conquer it. Anything you face. In fact, this is Ephesians 1, verse 19. Just check this out. This verse is awesome. I also pray, this is the Apostle Paul writing, I also pray that you would understand the incredible greatness of God's power. What are the next two words? Notice there's not just random power in the sky someplace, that God has great power for us. For, come on, say, for you and me. me. Look at the person next to you and say, even you. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. And then he says, this is so cool. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the what? Same power that raised Jesus is the power you have access to. For every struggle, for every issue, for everything you face. So you may have come in here and you feel like your marriage is about ready to crumble and you don't know where you're gonna turn and Christ is like, I got the power to fix this. You may come have come in the door and you're struggling with depression and discouragement and you feel like you've lost all sense of hope and Christ is going, I can fill you with hope. I have what nobody else has to offer. You may have come in here and you are struggling with an addiction, uh, uh, alcoholism and drug abuse. and uh, you, you may be struggling with this issue or that issue. And I want you to understand that Christ can conquer this stuff for you. Come on, say for me. for me. 
Because this power isn't just for him being raised from the dead. He rose from the dead so he could give this power to you so that you could conquer whatever you face. In Christ, you are more than a conqueror. Come on, say, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. That's what the book of Romans talks about, that you are more, which we're going to study starting next week, that you are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. You can get beyond the stuff that you face. Justin's story is just that story. Lots of people I've talked to over the years in Justin's shoes that have never got change. But they just didn't want to turn to Christ. We keep fighting in their own strength, fight, keep doing their own thing. Like, and everybody's welcome to. You can, you, can, you can kind of do what it is you want to do. Everybody gets to make their own choices. But when Justin said yes to Christ and he rejected all other ways of finding transformation and said, I'm just going to trust Jesus. Boom, he's a different dude than he was 18 months ago. And you can be different also. I, I'm different because of the cross, because of the resurrection. Number four, the resurrection of Jesus is life-changing because now we can be saved. Now, as soon as I say be saved, some of you are like, I don't, I don't really get what that means. And I'll just be real clear. The Bible says that Christ's death means you are saved from sin, Satan, and death. He, res he rescues you from sin, from the mistakes that we make. He rescues you from the evil one. He rescues you from Satan himself who came to steal, kill, and destroy according to uh, the book of John. And he rescues you from death itself. That though you might feel like your life is headed towards death, like you might feel like your life is broken and it's never gonna make progress, he's going, no, 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 I can give you life. This is what Christ came to do. He came to give you life and have it to the full. He came, to, he came so that you would be saved, not just from sin, Satan, and death, but also from depression, discouragement, exhaustion, pain, heartache, brokenness. Because the longer you are human, the more you are saddled with those words. Part of being human. You gotta have been how the disciples felt when they had all their hopes in this Jesus guy. And they saw him brutally murdered. Like, all right, he's the answer, he's the help. Oh killed him. I think a lot of times you hear maybe a sermon like this and you're like, maybe I'm going to get changed. Maybe something good could happen. Maybe I could finally, and then life hits you and you're like, oh, it's never going to be different. I'm never going to get past this. It's never really going to, I'm never really going to make progress. And that's why this, what I'm about ready to read next is so beautiful. This is John 20. The disciples are talking to a guy named Thomas. And they say this, hey, we saw the Lord. We saw Jesus alive. After death, and he replied, I, I won't believe unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and I place my hand in the wound at his side. Can you hear the discouragement in Thomas's voice? He was our leader, man. He was our hope. We were finally gonna get changed. I was so tired of this world. He was our answer, and they killed him. And he's just broken. Like a lot of us feel we think it's never gonna be different. Our hopes always get dashed. The other shoe always drops. We never really make progress. It's all just smoke and mirrors. You can hear his discouragement. And then eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with them. But Thomas is there now. The doors were locked and suddenly as before, boom, Jesus was standing there. And he said, peace be with you. And then he said, yo, Thomas, I know you're super discouraged. And I know you think that miracles don't happen. Put your finger right here in the place where you saw me murdered. Put your finger here in my side in the place where you saw the spear go in that, that, that ended my life. Touch my feet and the place where the nails went in. And then he says, don't be faithless any longer. Just believe I still do miracles. Thomas replies, so awesome. My Lord and my God. And in an instant, he goes from discouraged to full of hope. He goes from broken confident. He goes from doubting to let's go, bro. What's happening next? 
His whole world changes in an instant when he meets the resurrected Christ. Justin changed when he met the real Jesus. I changed at 17 when I met the real Jesus. Not religion, when I met the real Christ. I changed, he did a miracle in me that, is not, that does not make any sense. I am only standing here because of that miracle. And he can do it for you. In fact, he wants to do it. He wants to meet you in your doubt. He wants to meet you in your discouragement. He wants to meet you in your despair. And he wants to say, look, I'm real. I still do miracles. This is Romans 10 verse nine. This is the heart of Christ. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. In other words, you just out loud with your mouth say, Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That God still does miracles. If you believe this, you will be saved. See, I know how Justin got changed. He finally recognized that Jesus could still transform him. I know how I got changed. Declared with my mouth that Jesus, your Lord, you do miracles. You rose from the dead so you can conquer anything I face. And he began to change me. I I morphed. So can you. You can be different. It just means choosing to make Christ your leader and your Lord. No other hope, no other plan, no religion. Jesus. Jesus is the answer that you've been looking for. I invite you to close your eyes and bow your head for just a second. The text was pretty clear. It just says that if we openly confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're saved. So in other words, we just need to pray out loud to confess Christ as Lord, that we believe that he rose from the dead. And Christ will begin to stir in us. He'll begin to work in us. He'll begin to transform us from the inside out. So I'm gonna lead us in a simple prayer. You can pray in church, it's cool. People do it all the time. We're just gonna do a simple prayer out loud and I'm gonna invite you to pray it out loud for yourself. This Easter is an Easter for you to declare that Christ is Lord and that Christ can transform you. So just all over the room, out loud, just say, Jesus Christ, thank you that you rose from the dead so you can handle anything I face. Forgive my sins, transform my life, lead me. I make you my Savior and God. You're my leader and Lord. Take me to heaven when I die. Help me with my stuff now. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, if you're familiar with addiction and recovery ministry, that's called the third step. Turn your will and your ways over to the care of God he begins to transform you in ways you could not transform yourself. I want you to know if you prayed that for the first time, that you just got a church family that wants to walk with you, that wants to be with you on your journey of faith. We want you to keep coming back week after week to hear the gospel and hear the words and hear how Christ can continue to transform you and change you. This is just the first step. Come on, say first step. This is the first step in walking with God, the first step of transformation. Now, there is one more thing I didn't give you. There's one more thing I I didn't tell you yet, and I kind of saved the best for just kind of the icing on the cake. I got one more way in which the resurrection transforms us, and that's this. The resurrection of Jesus is life-changing because we can die to our old lives, and we can start brand new in Christ. We can die to our old lives and start brand new in Christ. That is what Justin did when he got baptized. Justin's baptism was him going, I don't want to be who I am anymore. I can't be this guy. I don't want to be this way. Pastor Silas is over there. He put, he put Justin down underneath the water in that lake. And Justin died to his old life. And then he came back up. And when he came back up, he came back up brand new. Well, this is what the scriptures say about baptism. I want you to see how this looks. This is Go ahead and put that on the screen for me. This is Romans chapter six, verses four and five. It says, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. This is why churches talk about baptism. 
Not, not just for infants, but for adults. Now, there's nothing wrong with baptizing a baby. It's just not in the Bible. It, it's just not in here. It's, it's, it's not any place in there. It's a nice thing that your parents did for you. But when Scripture actually talks about baptism, not tradition or religion, but when Scripture talks about baptism, it's an adult who's like, I don't want to be this way anymore. And they die to their old life. And they come back up and say, I live like Jesus. In fact, look at the verse. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. When you go down underneath that water, you're being buried like Christ was buried. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, like Christ was resurrected, now we also, when we come back up in the water, we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. So I got a suggestion. Just a suggestion. You can do what you want with it. Maybe you should consider baptism tonight. What do you mean? Well, that tank in the lobby, it's warm, it's heated, it's chlorinated. We got shorts, shirts, towels, and a pastor of baptism right here in the front row. He's the pastor of dunking. <laughs> pastor Ruben, just wave. And uh, if you hear all this, you're like, man, I, I do want to follow Christ. I do want, I do want life change. I do need a new start. I do need something different. I, I, I would suggest baptism. You came in here thinking, all right, I was going to have a nice service, and then I was going to go home, and I, I want you to know God was thinking, I could transform you. I could change you. Don't let the moment pass. In fact, when everybody else is leaving the service, you just come see Pastor Ruben in the front. He's going to be sitting right here on the front of the stage. You come in uh, and come talk to him, and he would happily give you short shirts and towel, and he would happily take you to the lobby and pray over you and baptize you. Uh, last night, we baptized 10 people. Come on, make some noise for that. Uh, this last service we baptized somebody. I know somebody's getting baptized after this one for sure, for sure already. I know one guy in particular is getting baptized. And if you, if you would like to make that choice, it just confirms what you believe. It doesn't, the baptism doesn't, isn't the thing that saves you. The confession and faith is what saves you. But the baptism confirms this is what you believe. This is that you're in, man. And when you go into the water, old life gone. Come back up. New life with Christ. So if that's you, you're like, man, I, I needed to hear that part. You come see your room when we're done. You glad you came to church tonight? I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet.